Hello and a really warm welcome to everybody who could join. My name is Part. I'm a data scientist at Neptune AI and in this talk I'll be going through how reasonable scale uh, ML teams keep track of their projects, lessons from the trenches. A quick heads up if you should have any questions please feel free to reach out and I'll make sure to answer them at the end of this session. Uh, in addition I'll be actually uh, posting some resources which are relevant for this talk so please feel free to go through them as well and if there are questions I'll be more than happy to answer them as well. So let's take this opportunity to directly hoop, uh, hop uh, onto an overview of this presentation and have you in line with the agenda. So a brief introduction of why we are at a prime position to present these insights, which will be followed by us maneuvering uh, through the MLOps tooling landscape and also motivating uh, the idea of sort of centralizing data from all those phases, how it looks at the moment which will lead us to uh, highlighting some of the approaches that ML teams use in order to organize their metadata. And this will act as a bridge for us to look into the case studies from high factors and continuum industries, what sort of processes they had in the in-house challenges and how they ended up solving those uh, challenges at the end, which will be followed by a conclusion. So let's jump uh, directly into an introduction. I believe as an organization, we sit at a very fascinating intersection where we get to interact with a lot of organization of various scales and sizes and brainstorm their ML processes and ML maturity model. And this sort of puts us in a prime spot to bring those, uh, some of those critical and, and um, sort of interesting insights from those uh, collaborations when it comes to what optimal processes look like when for, for say specific use uh, cases. And hence the ideation of uh, this session or the talk and hopefully we can add some value in your uh, in-house processes as well or provide insights as to what is an optimal direction to move forward into. This brings me directly uh, to uh, like highlighting uh, the underlying problem with, with um, MLOps ecosystem in general is uh, the lack of standardization. And this actually can be attributed to the fact that it's, it's uh, a field which is in like really early stages. It's an infancy. <clears throat> so what we see on your screen, um, and, and I've sort of included this image to highlight the very fact that this is a rapidly growing ecosystem where we are effectively adding hundreds of tools, catering to several phases of the MLOps life cycle every year. And it's really difficult to sort of keep track uh, of what tooling you should be using. But at the same time, as you end up composing your MLOps life cycle from an array of tools, you end up uh, scattering your data across um, products. And this uh, results in a situation where uh, you do not have that data centralized from all the phases and you do not have a way of sort of drawing insights from that data and acting on that data at the same time collaborating in an effective manner to iterate on your models introduction or for example uh, having an effective retraining procedure at the end. So this sort of motivates, like further motivates the idea that there is a need that you have to centralize data from all those phases into say a centralized metadata store where you can log data from starting from your data phase to your monitoring phase and sort of uh, draw insights in an integrated environment with certain standardization imposed on it instead of having that data sort of are scattered all over the place and, and making it really hard to sort of collaborate on that data. So this leads us to asking this question and also motivating the idea that it is important to have your model in production, but you can only uh, improve on those models and collaborate on those models and make incremental uh, gains uh, only if you have an overall control over the entire model life cycle, starting from training to production. And what I mean when I say having control over the model life cycle is imposing some sort of reproducibility when, you, when it comes to MLOps life cycle. 
where you can track your model lineage, you can track your data lineage, and just just being able to reproduce that life cycle. Uh, and, and the way you can do it is, is, again, if you have a central source of truth where you have been logging all that data and you've been organizing all that data. This brings me to sort of briefly introducing uh, a standard sort of MLOps life cycle. Of course, if, if uh, it, it depends on your use case and, and your problem space as to how that life cycle looks for you. Uh, but again, the objective here is to present some sort of standardization across uh, what sort of phases you have when it comes to MLOps life cycle. It usually starts with a data phase where um, you, you, you usually start with an ED or data analysis or the feasibility of the data in order to train your models, which moves into the phase where you have data validation prep and you start with model training. You build a whole logic around, say, model evaluation and model selection to identify the best models. And then you start with the ops uh, side of things where you want to put that model in production. So usually you have a pipeline, a deployment sort of mechanism where you go ahead and um, identify the best model and then say expose it as an API endpoint and, and like have that model in production. Once you have served your model, you have uh, this model exposed as an API endpoint. This is a predictive service. And what you want to do at this point is uh, you want to keep monitoring how your model is working on the real world data on a certain metric. Uh, you want to identify if there are any drifts on that specific metric. And as soon as your model's performance deteriorates on that metric or goes below or above a certain threshold, you sort of want to um, uh, retrain your model or reevaluate your model on those metrics and have like the most um, optimal model on a certain metric in production again. So you have this retraining sort of approach um, happening here where you uh, sort of monitor your model in the production. So we very quickly realized that an MLOps lifecycle can actually be composed of a lot of moving parts and can become a problem in itself because more often than not, a lot of companies go ahead and stitch together an MLOps life cycle uh, composed of various products. And not all those products go through, say, similar mechanisms of standardizing how they store a data. So your data sits in all those products with no standardization and yeah, really, really um, uh, inefficient when it comes to say acting on the data and organizing that data and collaborating on that data. It again sort of motivates the idea that you need to build that abstraction layer on all these phases on your own where you centrally fetch data from all these phases and organize them for yourself in a way so that you can either debug, retrace errors or iterate on your models in a more effective and efficient way. And this brings me to a, a very interesting bridge where we go through some of the approaches that ML teams use in-house uh, in order to uh, sort of uh, try uh, to organize data as they start to scale uh, and grow in terms of model or either uh, the terms of the size of the theme itself. So one of the approaches which we see uh, often is naming conventions. So a lot of uh, organizations tend to use naming conventions and in, in an effort to sort of organize that data. Another approach which we actually encounter pretty often is folder structures where they go ahead and leverage the fact that you can uh, um, organize your folders in a specific hierarchy to sort of log that metadata from specific runs. Again, this lacks the fact that you cannot effectively collaborate on such, uh, such data unless, unless uh, you do some pretty uh, active standardization on, on, on how you store that data. Another approach which we encounter pretty often is branch naming, where um, you have a remote uh, repo and, and you use branches as either to log experiments or you log different phases of your MLOps life cycle and organize meta data that way. Again, uh, it is prone to human errors and uh, the overhead that goes into learning Git operations and gates, uh, there, I mean, something goes wrong there. 
one of the approaches we uh, see a lot of organizations do is they end up building in-house proprietary uh, tools however uh, more often than not they do not um, have all the features they need uh, so they, they do have a specialized tool for their requirements and need but they do not have all the features uh, to they need and at the same time the overhead maintenance uh, leads it to a situation where it's like a product inside a product so you have to invest a lot of hours to keep it updated and maintain it in-house uh, another uh, sort of uh, like arrangement which we see a lot of organizations using is self-hosting uh, say an open source uh, project where again the overheads associated with them as as as, as uh, pretty steep in case you start logging a lot of experiments and the final sort of solution is going for an end-to-end -end, uh, platforms where uh, yeah you can organize most of the phases of your ml ops life cycle within a single platform again this leads to a situation where you are limited to the features provided by that platform and sort of uh, contained within an ecosystem Highlighting some of like some of the limitations I've already highlighted, but going through them one once again, these approaches require a lot of manual effort. There's a scope of a lot of human error. Information again is scattered over a lot of places. There's limit limited collaboration, and all these uh, sort of approaches do not scale really well. And at this stage, I've sort of gone ahead and summarized four major pain points these organizations encounter as they maneuver the MLOps metadata organization space. And one of uh, the pointers which they encounter pretty often is organizing metadata. So more often than not, as you're working with all these phases, you do have a mental model of how that data should look uh, in terms of uh, how you want to organize it, but at, at the same time, you also have a mental model of how you want to use that data, what s sort of insights you would want to draw out of that data. And so they're always looking for a tool or a platform where you have that flexibility of organizing data uh, to represent uh, that already existing mental model of that data. Um, another aspect which I think a lot of organizations struggle with and rightly so, because it, it's a very challenging problem, is reproducibility. How do they go about reproducing either certain experiments or certain phases of their, of their MLOps life cycle in general? And again, this uh, relates back to how they organize data as well as how they standardize all the hyperparameters for all these phases. And the third uh, component with a, a lot of organizations lack if they're say using some self-hosted solutions or some of the open open source solutions is uh, the ease of collaborating on that data. So when it comes to collaboration, uh, the ability to sort of see what your teammates are working on, but at the same time share uh, your own experiments, your own insights and all those sort of workflows um, are, are really crucial in, in, in making a gains um, when it comes to effectively working on a problem and, and improving on it. And of course, the final uh, sort of uh, pain point or challenge a lot of organizations face is with self-hosted solution or in-house solutions, the maintenance overheads and, and the effort that goes into just keeping that solution running and also, um, yeah, keeping that sol uh, solution persistent if you're hosting it on your own is a big challenge a lot of these companies face. So this, this leads me into a brief introduction of what we do as an organization. And um, so we are a metadata store for MLOps where we intend to sort of organize metadata from uh, several phases of the MLOps life cycle. Uh, the phases we right away cater to are starting from say data versioning to experiment tracking to model registry and it can also go uh, to a lot of uh, metadata which we um, intend to organize say from a monitoring environment as well and also a lot of data from say model retraining and fine tuning. So you do uh, end up having a single source of truth when it uh, comes to your say MLOps life cycle but uh, the additional aspect is you have a lot of analytical abstractions and a lot of features in-house which let you sort of 
uh, extract the most insightful and most actionable uh, uh, properties of that data and use it in several processes uh, within your organization as well. This leads us directly to the first case study which we carried out in collaboration with Hype Factors. They are a media intelligence company and a reputation tracking domain. Uh, they analyze data. Uh, I mean, they work with multimodal data. They analyze data from image to structured data. And the problems primarily range um, starting from NLP to uh, computer vision. And they also do some regression problems on the structured data. So the experiments uh, effectively uh, yeah, include, um, say, say um, experiments from different domains. So there is this inherent need of organizing or uh, clustering those set of experiments in an effective way. So their primary needs were uh, to effectively organize data as well as sort of visualize the generated metadata in a way so that it's actionable. Uh, let's uh, quickly have a look uh, through their workflow which they had in-house prior to um, the Neptune integration. So uh, they, they were using a PyTorch uh, and Hugging Face in, in order to run some of the NLP experiments. They had Hydra to keep a track of uh, the configurations across, across experiments and they were effectively running their experiments in a cloud instance. Uh, for collab they didn't have a centralized experiment a tracking solution in-house uh, and for collaboration they were using um, Slack uh, to be able to share uh, the uh, like uh, the outcomes of the experiment, artifact, metadata, and they were also using uh, Meet to sort of share the outcomes of their experiments. Some of the main challenges that they were facing uh, with this workflow were primarily around collaboration. So they were using Slack for a collaboration where they were sharing artifacts and model metadata through Slack. Uh, which, which can already pose a lot of uh, challenges. And uh, the, the way they were sort of addressing um, reproducibility is through personal notes. So they were annotating their runs through personal notes and files. So you were uh, uh, share, uh, storing your configuration files and sharing them with your personal annotations, which lack some uh, kind of standardization. So there was no sort of global structure to that metadata uh, or there was no global organization. And because there was no global organization, it was really difficult to reproduce experiment. And um, at this point, I would like to sort of contrast uh, both the experiment tracking dimension and the uh, collaboration dimensions, which what they what it looked like after they integrated with Neptune. So let's have a look at the experiment tracking component. So after uh, we integrated with the experiment tracking uh, sort of um, phase of that uh, workflow, they, they were able to sort of go ahead and centralize all the experiments in a single place where they had the ability to s segregate uh, their uh, experiments from different domains using specific dedicated views. So they could cluster their uh, NLP experiments in a single view, uh, their structured data regression problem in another view. So that way they could um, share these experiments rather easily without having to dig through their local logs and organization. Uh, in effect, it also allowed though, them some comparison capabilities and abstractions which Neptune provides off the shelf. So they could uh, choose a set of experiments from a specific domain and sort of draw comparisons on it and see which experiment did lead to, say, um, an optimal outcome. So it also led to an expedited um, uh, a workflow where you are able to identify the best experiments rather f fast and another example of how you can draw these uh, comparisons in the screenshot below. V when it came to sort of a collaboration, uh, their uh, uh, collaboration was enhanced with the use of persistence link. So all the views which we saw on the uh, previous screen, they have uh, a persistent link associated with that view. 
So effectively what you could do is you could either through Slack or email, just sh share that specific view with some of your teammates and show them the outcome of your experiment. And again, uh, adding users to your projects uh, and creating new views is, is actually pretty easy. So just to give you a, a contrast of how their workflow initially looked and what it ended up being and, and how Neptune ended up solving the experiment, tracking and collaboration aspect of that workflow and made it easier for them to sort of reproduce experiments at the end. This brings us to our second case study, which was carried out in collaboration with Continuum Industries. The reason I wanted to include this in this presentation was for the fact that it's very distinct uh, from the traditional machine learning workflows. So they do work on optimization as is machine learning, but they are using evolutionary algorithms in order to run these optimizations. And it so happens that their needs uh, uh, for tracking and visualization abilities are aligned with what you need in machine learning domain as well. So a quick intro of the organization, and then we look at uh, how they integrated with Neptune and their up up updated workflow. So they do op uh, automate and optimize the design of linear infrastructure. This can include water uh, pipelines. They have a proprietary uh, offering, Optineer, where they uh, run evolutionary optimization algorithms to find specific solutions under certain constraints. And their problem domain specifically deals with geospatial data. And the kind of expertise they need ranges from mechanical engineering to software engineering. So a pretty involved uh, workflow overall. So let's have a look at some of uh, the challenges they were facing as, as they had their uh, in-house proprietary solution. So they were sort of maintaining a database of baseline problems on which they would uh, run an algorithm to see what the outcomes are. So these uh, were actually quite a lot of problems where they could effectively have to run these algorithms. And they also wanted to have some sort of visualization abstractions built on top of the outcomes of these uh, runs to um, see uh, which um, optimizations indeed lead to the uh, desired outcome. So one of the drawbacks and one of the major drawbacks was the system was um, really, um, I mean, it wasn't easy to update that system. So as soon as you had to change those baseline problems, or if you had to update any of those baseline problems, you uh, practically had to do a rehaul of, of the whole s system. So there was no way you could do it easily. So it became a really complex to maintain that system specifically with the growing need of the theme and uh, the need to run more and more experiments. So it, it actually became a product within a product and they just could not uh, uh, do with the overhead and how resource intensive it became. So they decided to sort of try uh, other solutions out uh, available out there in the machine learning space. And we were able to sort of collaborate with them and update their workflow. And I'll walk you, I'll take this opportunity to sort of walk you through their updated workflow and how they solved the problem they had in um, on hand. So like effectively, they were using the SaaS uh, solution which we provide. Um, and like if we go through the workflow, they did run all the experiments in EC2 instances. They had some sort of data versioning using DVC where they track the versions of their geospatial data. They also used Git uh, code plus configuration in order to impose some degree of reproducibility in their experiments. Then they ran tests against their baseline problems. And the way they integrated with Neptune is they gathered and uh, stored metrics from all these runs. Uh, they did some post processing on these metrics where they extracted uh, some of the statistics around the outcomes. Uh, they logged each of these tests as a unique run in the interface and they also had a human in the loop approach at the end where they sort of keep uh, a track of improvements between those runs or if there is a degradation between those runs. So this is how their overall sort of workflow looks like after the integration. So they could do away with uh, the in-house maintenance of the database having uh, to 
like having the requirement of updating the database on every occasion they had to uh, change the baseline uh, problems in addition they did have a lot of uh, comparison analytical tools and abstractions built on uh, over their experiments which were provided off the shelf and they also had some visualization capabilities to see which tests actually led to the desired outcome and in effect they also integrated with github actions where they were automating some of the jobs and uh, to sum up this uh, presentation i'll leave you with a gif of uh, how they uh, actually how their experiments actually looked after the organization and i'm here please feel free to reach out with questions and i'll be more than happy to answer them right away and of course at the later stage you can always uh, reach out to me on my email and i'll be more than happy to follow up with your specific queries yeah so see you soon